Welcome everyone to the Pockets of Knowledge podcast. I'm your host, Desiree Stanley. And with me today is my guest, Jonna willoughby Lore. How are you today? I am doing okay. <laughs> I am doing very well. And I'm excited about our conversation today. Jonna, you are the founder and owner of the Paper Craft Miracles Company. And I, you know, did some Google searching because I really was like, what does she do? And this is so interesting. First of all, I just have to give you some accolades. You were featured in magazines. You were on Discovery Plus channel, which is so cool. And you've won some awards. And I, I hope you'll share that with us later. But you make handcrafted, sustainable gifts and decor. And so I, I looked at some of the designs and things that you've made, and it's just lovely. And our conversation today is going to be a little bit about how your journey led you to this and how art has been influential in your life in relating to some topics that maybe grief and sadness and things like that. So again, welcome, Jonna. I'm so glad that you're here. Let's dive in. I'm really excited. Yeah, cool. So do please share with us how this journey kind of happened for you and how did you get into launching your business? The whole story is a very long story. So I've been get, trying to get better at doing the shorter version of it. But I originally went away to college to be a poet. I've been writing my whole entire life since I was like five years old and started performing when I was 12. So at that point, I was doing lots of poetry slams and was like really out doing a lot of that kind of stuff. And I got a scholarship to go to school for that. But when I got there, I started looking through the course catalog and I saw that they had all these classes in paper making and book binding. And they had a whole book arts department. It's like, I didn't even know that was a thing that you could study, let alone that they had those classes where I had to go to school. So I met with that teacher. I had signed up for all of those classes that I could get into. I'd always made my own journals. My mom was a paper crafter. She loved to do like rubber stamps and screen printing and stuff like that and collages. She did all these like stuck on collages. She was really cool. And so I ended up taking these classes and they were amazing. And I learned about artist books. And for those who don't know, artist books are really amazing art form where the form of the book, the design, the illustrations, the words that are in it, the materials it's made out of, like how it opens, what it sounds like when it opens, what it feels like when it opens all work together to make one bigger concept or a bigger idea and as soon as I learned about that I was like that's what I've been trying to do my whole life I love doing poetry and I love the performative act and reading to people and performing for people but I always wanted to do more because there's people who don't get poems when you just read them mm -hmm. I wanted it to be a whole experience so I learned about those. I took all these classes, met with my college advisor at the end of that year. And I said, hey, these are all the classes I took. What major am I working toward? Those are all electives. Oh, no. And I was there at a scholarship. And I was like, look, I, I can't have wasted an entire year. What am I supposed to do now? And he asked me a question that changed my life. I didn't know it at the time, but he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an artist and I don't want to be broke. And he said, you should do that as your major. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's not a major. If it was a major, everyone would take it. And he said that they had an integrative studies major. And that he said, most people don't know, and you know, when they're in their 40s, what they want to do with the rest of their life. He said, you already know when you're 19. He's like, do it. Make up your own major. Spend the rest of your college career figuring out how to make money with art. Do it. So long story short, I did. And during my junior year, I still hadn't quite figured out exactly how I was going to integrate all the things that I like to do into one, you know, saleable business, but I was working on it. And three weeks into my junior year, my mom was on bread and I was like, really? Is someone making a movie about me? On Friday the 13th? Really? And then four months later, on what would have been her next birthday, my dorm burnt to the ground. While I was in Ooh. toast, every single thing I that was in there, is all my journals for my whole entire life, all of my artwork I'd made up until that point, like first three, three, 
two and a half, three years of school. All my instruments, all my books, all of my art supplies, obviously, clothes, who cares about those? All of those really special things. And also, everything my mom had given me in the last five years, her life. They were all my most special things, and I wanted to have them with me, and they were all gone on her birthday. And the first day after, I was kind of like walking around in a haze after watching the roof of my home fly off and land in the road on fire. And I lived in a motel with six other people, like a two-room suite with six people for a while. But on the third day after fire, I they always say on the third day, from the weird shit. On the third day after, I looked at my college roommate and I said, dude, all our shit burned up. And I started laughing and she started laughing and we started rolling on the ground laughing like a bunch of crazy people. But after I, I had been looking for the ways that I could learn something from what it and it would have been my mom's 55th birthday and five has always been my lucky number. So I know that there are two lucky things that are coming because of this. My mom was very spiritual. She was very religious, very much connected to the energies of the world. I knew if something major happened on her birthday, she made that for a reason. And I don't want to be one of those people that says everything happens for a reason because that's a little shit, right? Sometimes stuff just happens and it sucks. But this particular thing, I am meant to learn at least two things about how I am very lucky because this. One was really obvious. Me and everyone else who was in there got, was like got out a lot and only one person injured and it wasn't life threatening, which is amazing for a whole bunch of drunk college students in the middle of the night in a very old dorm that in four hours worked to the ground. The whole building. So it was quick. But the other lucky thing it took until that third day. And, and my mom, while she was an amazing person, sucked at adulting. We lived in a house that was full of crap. I didn't know that quarters were a thing until I saw that show, Hoarders. I had a panic attack and I was like, oh my God, that was my house. I never even knew we had hardwood floors until I was 20 years old. I never saw and I just remember so many times that she would always say, I might need that someday. I might need that someday. And she couldn't get rid of things. And because our house was like that, she couldn't have friends over. She couldn't do things, you know, like it was constantly stopping her from doing a lot of the things she really loved to do and interacting with people. And on that third, it just hit me. She's sending me a lesson that she didn't learn in her life that you are never going to need that stuff. You don't need it. None of it. Not one thing that was in that room is something that I needed to serve. And I just kept thinking, I was like, you know what? Comes back to five, right? There's five things you need to survive. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need someone that loves you and someone that drives you. Everything else is, it's dessert. It's all extra. 20 years old, that's where I was at. And started making all of these artist books about my experiences and going through grief and trauma and really just being so damn happy that I was alive and so free. When you don't have any stuff, it's so freeing. You don't think it is. And I had definitely, you know, growing up in a hoarder house with the mom of the chain smoker, I thought about losing all my stuff in a fire almost every day of my life until I went away to college when it actually happened. And thinking about all that and making this artwork, really wanting to inspire all the people around me who had also, a lot of those people had also lost their stuff in this fire. I wanted to inspire all those people to seize the day. Life is short. You never know when you could die in fire or you could get hit by a bus or get cancer or whatever. And then all the energy that makes you live is going to go make something else live. And that's, and so the time that you have in this body goes quick. Even if you get to be an old person, it still goes quick. And so I was really wanting to impart these. I started making these books and doing these show and tell events, like performances kind of thing, where I was like showing them and reading them and the people that I showed them to would cry. And I had so many people come up to me afterwards and say, I'm a different person than I was 10 minutes before I started. Or you've inspired me 
to go after the thing that I have been thinking. Or I had just so many of those experiences, some of them from teachers who had been teaching their whole lives. And immediately I was like, you know what? I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I want to do And I want to do that intentionally, purpose. And that's why I named my business Papercraft Miracles because it's the miracle that saved me when I literally had. Wow. So that's the short version of a very long story. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I am so sorry about having had to go through that, but you shared in there about things having meaning stuff happens for a reason. And, you know, sometimes that is BS and it just sucks. Some, this thing happened, but when we can explore, perhaps there is some deeper thing that we need to pull out of it. And as you shared, there were things for you that came from that. And it really kind of led down this path for you to create this life because of that experience. And so I think that's such a great reminder for all of us that life is short. Do the thing you want to do. Don't let anything hold you back. Right? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about the how the crafts and the art really helped you with the grief and you know how you're using that to help other people. When I started making a lot of these, I was mostly a poet at that point, you know, like a storyteller. And I had gotten really good at using poetry to talk about grief, things that I'd gone through that were difficult in a way that was digestible, right? I can tell something very difficult, really harrowing in a poem and be distanced from it a little bit. That, like I can say it, it's outside of me. Other people can see that story. They can get that story. They can understand that story. I can kind of look at it from the outside. So the first thing I did was doing a lot of poems, writing a lot of poems. Every day, I mean, I, it's kind of crazy because the first, you know, four months after I lost my mom, I, I had a friend of mine had given me a journal <laughs> to write in. I filled it up and it burnt up. But it, it didn't matter. Like, it didn't matter that those things were gone because the point that really hit it home for me was that I had always written to explain myself to myself. I was like a really mm-hmm. dorky kid. I got bullied a lot. And I always wrote in my journal to be like, does this make sense? Am I a crazy person? Or if I write this down and read it out loud, you know, is that something someone else would say is reasonable or whatever? Are these feelings so intense just for me or do other people feel that way? And once I started sharing my poems, I was like, oh, cool. I can capture things that other people feel but don't know how to say. And so I really, when I first started making the, the books that I was making, that's the kind of thing that I was doing, was creating physical, experience, tangible experiences out of things that are really difficult for other people to at sharing those things with other people, making them help to heal me. Just having, handling paper, anything, handling something tangible, working with art materials in your hands, getting those emotions that live inside your body, out of your body and into something else that you can see outside of yourself. Makes it so much easier to make sense of something and gets it out into the world. And so I was doing a lot of stuff. But once I started sharing them with people and realized that the ways that I was processing grief and processing trauma and healing myself were healing for other people, I was like, I'm so hooked on this. You know, not only is it good for me, but it's good for everybody else. And that's great for the world. That's how you change the world. Like you have those conversations and have those experiences that have the potential to change the way that thinks or feels their place in the world forever yeah no like just knowing that every single day that i had the capacity to do that for somebody was like there is nothing else (laughs) so i ended up 
really working a lot on people skills. And part of my major, integrating business and art together, I knew that selling art was not like selling any other product. Coupon, not going to work. And if it does, they're not really a good Because somebody who's going to invest in art, someone who's going to buy art from you, they're buying the experience of how you make them feel and how that piece of art makes them feel. And sometimes it's not even having that artwork. Seeing that artwork or feeling that artwork or hearing that song or whatever reminds them of the experience they had personally. And so I took a bunch of social work classes because if I'm going to be making the kind of art that I want to make that involves working with other people, I got to learn how to get people to say those things they don't want to say. I have to figure out how to hear those things in the things that people are saying to figure out what they're not saying Mm -hmm. and then help them learn how to say those. And so some of the things that we've done in my company that kind of embody that spirit of it for me, like we had this woman whose best friend was dying. She had this box of all of her friends' photos from her whole life. And she was, I don't even know who most of these people are, but she's with it enough right now where she could tell me who these people are. Can you make me two copies of a photo album that has all these pictures in it with space around them so that I can sit with her and she can tell me who all these people are and I can write it down and take notes of who they are. I can have one to keep. I can give one to her family. And she brought us some of her friend's old silk handkerchiefs and stuff like that. And we built those into the books. They were part of the cover. Yes, that is a really difficult situation to deal with right like she's in a tight spot it was a quick turnaround time obviously because we knew she didn't have a lot of time but we were able to give them those last couple of weeks to be together and celebrate and for her friend to remember all those memories and to be able to share her whole entire life not just with her friend but to be able to keep that as a legacy for her whole family i get to do stuff like that I had a a woman who had a foster baby and she loved this baby girl and she had him for two and a half years. Then his family got their shit together and she was like, I would describe the book, all the art he made at daycare and all these pictures that I can still have him in, in my memories, in my house. And so like, I get to do stuff like that. It's not every single day that I get to do stuff like that, but you know, Having those clients and helping those clients gives me so much inspiration to know that I'm doing things that are helping them heal from something. And that whenever they see that, they remember that experience, going to someone and say, I have this problem. I need to be able to connect in some way. Can you help me do that? And I did. That's so great. It's my favorite. Yeah, that's amazing, Jonna. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And there's so many things that you said in there, just such good stuff. I love that art really, whether it's a painting or music or poetry, helps us make sense of the world, right? And like you said, we don't always know how to express the things that we're feeling or thinking, but when you see art, It touches you in a way, or you're hearing a song or poetry. It just unlocks something inside you. And so I think art is amazing and we absolutely have to have it in our life in whatever form. And so I think what you're doing is fabulous in helping these people stay connected to loved ones or, you know, just their memories You can't beat that. It's amazing what you're doing. When you were describing writing for yourself in your journals, trying to make sense of your life and your experiences, I think that every one of us should be doing that on a daily basis because it can change our entire life when we have that time to reflect and think about these things, these experiences and and reflect on them, like you said, in kind of a distanced fashion. Changes our whole perspective, right? 
I'm working on a book right now. I've been through a lot of things, but even before I went to college and had all that in good ways and bad ways. And I, because of the way I was raised, I got to live like three lives at the same mm -hmm. time. My parents were married to other people when I was born. So I'm like the oops baby out of the middle of all these relationships. But instead of it being a situation where nobody wanted me in the middle, everybody wanted me in the middle in some capacity. So I actually lived at three houses every single week my entire childhood. And I got to be the oldest kid at one house and the middle kid at the other house and the baby at the other house. So I really got to have all of those experiences. But I also didn't live with any of my family members 100%. And most people grow up with a completely different outlook on relationships and dealing with people and how to run a life and how to run a household. And, you know, they only have, if they're lucky, two parents who take care of them and teach them about how to be a good person out in the world. And I had parents my whole life and seven brothers and sisters, but I was an only wow. It's really weird. People have been telling me since I was in kindergarten that I got it right away because that's like my family structure as I was raised was just weird. And all of my parents were divorced at least once before I was born. Many of them also were divorced again after I was born because, whoops. But they also got remarried. A lot of them got remarried. More kids and they got divorced again. And, you know, there's a lot of that. And so I've been writing this book, but because of it, I haven't been doing nearly as much like daily journaling type things or writing as many poems or that kind of stuff and I find because I am an artist as my career I don't have nearly as much time to do the kind of art that I really want to do all the time because I do a lot of working on the business my staff do a lot of working in the business that kind of thing but I do still find time to play music at my band I have two bands and I do that kind of thing and I still go to open mic sometimes but for anyone else who's out there who is like a multidisciplinarian, like that has like several different passions that you really like to do and you find it really hard to juggle all the things, just something my mom told me as a kid when I was talking about writing, I was like, oh, well, I hate this poem. It's never going to be good or whatever. She goes, just in a drawer. You'll find it later. She says, don't worry about it right now. She's like, writing can never go bad. It can always get better. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing about all your different art forms or whatever your passions are, right? Like they're never going to go bad. You can put them on hold for a while. And especially because I know your audience is a lot of women too. You know, if you have small kids at home and you feel like you have zero minutes in the day to do any of the shit that you care about, it's coming back around, girl. <laughs> it's okay when you have small kids to do literally none of those things you love to do for a little while but like, bring them in. your kids will learn amazing things when you're not there from other people <laughs> wow that's uh, such a unique experience of having grown up as you just shared with us i think that it probably had you know some ups and downs because i can imagine there was a lot of different ways of handling experiences from the different parents I come from a blended family as well. And so I know that my mom here had a different way of doing it than my mom here. And that can pose some challenges, but it can also, you know, open our mind to different ways of handling things. It's like how we are framing it that I think makes a difference and so unique. And thank you for sharing that with us. And, and lastly, what you just shared about if you've got little ones, and you feel like you have no time for anything that you want to do, I love that point. Just put it on pause for a minute. You'll get time. I promise you I'm on the other side now. You'll get time. It's just going to be a few more years yet. And, you know, you sneak those things in. And like we see a lot is when we have our children involved in the things we love doing, it opens up things for them as well and shows them possibilities. So I think it's fair to say, don't keep all those experiences that you have or want to do separate. For real. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. My, it's my studio is in the same building where I live, but it's in a separate space. My kids, they get off the bus and they're sitting on the couch in my office, you know, doing their homework and stuff like that. And 
there's, we have one table in the studio that's the kid table and there's always toys and stuff in here. My middle son has like already started his own little art business called Thoroughly Good, where he makes his own little drawings and art and cardboard robots and stuff. And whenever people come into my shop and stuff, stop in off the street, if he's in here, he will grab them by the hand. He's a very shy kid, but he will grab them by the hand and be like, I have things to sell. They're over here. And he's got his own little display area with his stuff. And you know, for seeing my kid and asking him, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? He goes, I want to be an artist. You know, he's sick and he's like, there is no other option. I'm going to be an artist. I want to make tons of money. You know, and I have no doubts that he that. And mom guilt is real, right? Mom guilt is so real. I ended up quitting my full-time job shortly after I had my first. It was definitely not my plan to be a stay-at-home. Not that there is anything wrong with being a stay-at-home mom. I just didn't want to do that. We also had a huge mortgage. We had just bought a tiny commercial building, which had a five-year pay. And we were in year two and had a baby. And then my job was like, you have to either come back into the office full time, or figure something else. And I was like, they don't pay me enough to cover health care and daycare. So if I come back full time, I'm going to pay someone else to raise my kid and come home with negative dollars. Not worth it. And so my husband said, it's cool. If you made more money, then I'd quit and stay home. But you don't. So stay home and quote unquote, do your book thing. Because at the time I was mostly just making I didn't have paper making equipment or anything like that. And he's, yeah, do your book thing. And we never really had this conversation. We just figured out that was a poor choice. His vision of quote unquote, do your book thing was very different from my vision of do your book thing. And he grew up with a stay at home, which is great. But she was at home full time with the kids till his youngest brother was a senior in school. I cooked myself dinner when I was six. My mom had five part-time jobs and she was never home. And so like our childhoods were very different. So when he was like, oh, it's cool. You just stayed home with the kids and figure, you know, do your book thing. He thought I was going to be like the stay-at-home mom that sometimes did craft shows on the And I had gone to school to create a business out of my art. That was my major in college. Like I had, by the time I graduated, I had a 25 page business plan. I had a print catalog. I had business cards. I had samples. I had work already. And I had been making work on the side ever since. Really small time because I also had a full-time job. But I had that. And I still have it sitting on my desk. Still has the same name, Papercraft Miracle, right on the side of the binder from 2004. And so quitting my job right at the beginning of 2000. And he goes, do your book thing. I was like, I'm going to do the shit out of my book. Right? I got this plan. I have never not had to go to work since I made and now I don't since to get and go somewhere else and fulfill someone else's dreams all day long I choose to do that and I'm like so I'm gonna sleep till 10 my baby in my bed and I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna figure out how to do my book thing while I'm figuring out how to do this mom thing and my oldest son was in my office in my studio my studio was in a bedroom one of our bedrooms I had a little doorway jumper and I would put him in the jumper. He was like well, eight months old when I quit or something like that. And I would sit at my computer and figure out how to grow a business. And I had never spent any of the money that I'd ever made selling art, put it in the business. Bank. And I did in there the whole time because I was like, someday I'm going to save up enough money. I'm going to buy all this paper making equipment. I'm going to really do it up like how I want to because I had a budget. I knew how much I needed. I had a list above my desk. All the things I was buy someday when I hadn't like, with the prices, everything. And it was like I started posting on Instagram. How am I going to build a business at home with a baby? I'm like, I can't go out to all these networking meetings all the time. Like, how am I going to meet people? I got to meet people who can afford my art first of all. You know, like how am I going to meet those people? I knew lots of artists, but artists don't have any money. So I was like, how am I going to sell art? Um, and I really started thinking like it's a different world than it was in 2004 when I graduated college. Like social media was at home. You could not make your own website that you could things in 2004. And so I immediately used some of the money I'd saved. I hired a friend to rebrand my company and to teach me how to use Squarespace. And she set up my brand kit and 
she just put it all together, did the basic stuff and was like, oh, here's how you use it. I was like, oh, I could do this. Cool. And I built out my website and just kept adding things to it and adding things to it. And I started building up my Instagram and had a Facebook page, business page since you can too. So I easily was like, oh, I can kind of send people from here over here and share different things up platforms or whatever. I, I knew that I wasn't just going to be sharing the journey of how do I make a business as an art, artist, but I was like, how do you follow the things that you love and really pursue those things while you're also at home with me? You know, like, I'm no longer just an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur, right? And I was sharing the things I was learning about being a while also sharing things I was learning about growing a business at the same time. And then in between sharing the projects that I was working on and like meeting people and getting hired to do stuff. And I did all of that on Instagram. With my job, I had 300 followers on Instagram. And now I have over 6,000 followers on Instagram. You know, I didn't pay for any of those people. I just kept showing up and utilizing those platforms in the way that I did. And realizing that not only that those are free, first of all, you should totally do that, but that getting your story out there and quote unquote selling art is not like selling anything else. People do business with people. And I started using Instagram, like my journal. Every evening when I'm like, oh, what am I going to post today? Look through my photos that I took and pick something that, you know, I want to write about. And then I write about it. And that's where all my are. And it didn't take long to post those things. And it didn't take long for people to re- say, hey, that makes me want to write a book. That makes me want to go make some art. That makes me want to get my baby out of this. And I realized that I just, I had the ability to affect change. From I started doing a lot of those things. And business pretty quickly from where I was. And I was like, I didn't think that was going to happen so fast. I felt lots of mom guilt about all the time like once it took off i was like oh well, i'm gonna have to spend some time with him at home with the babysitter or whatever and hire some child care or do lots of work in the evenings and the weekends and spend like hardly any time with my husband and my kid and it's great and all this and that there were struggles that part of it. but for all the moms that are feeling all the mom guilt about pursuing the things that you love just remember all the things that your kid is learning because they're spending time with in the same way that a teacher at school can give your kids an amazing education that you might not be able to give them all by yourself at home, spending time with other quality, great adults helps them learn about different relationships, interact with people, and they get those experiences where they're, they have a person who's fully invested in taking care of them. And if you're a crazy, busy mom, right? Everybody says crazy, busy. If you're a crazy, busy mom trying to run a business, trying to do this, trying to do that, and you're expected to juggle taking care of a child all the time, they don't have your focus and they know it. It's okay to hire some child care or, you know, make friends with another mom down the street and trade, right? It's okay. It's good for your kids. It's good for you to have that. Because you get dedicated time to focus on yourself. And they get dedicated. I was someone focusing. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh my gosh. Thank you for, (laughs) yeah, for sharing all of that with us. It's just amazing. So much good stuff in there for, you know, moms who are, like you said, maybe unsure about, do I just spend all my time with my child? Can I explore these other things I want to do? Is it okay? Not feeling guilt and really remembering that. Your child gains experiences of the world through other people that they're with. And so that's such a great point. And thank you for sharing that with the listeners, because that's an awesome reminder. Love it. So this kind of makes me think about if there are listeners who are artists who are trying to figure out, like, how do I make this into a business? And you talked a little bit in there about you know, Squarespace and working with others to help you kind of build this up. What are some maybe pieces of advice you want to share for those people? Okay. First of all, I'm working on a course for this exact thing right now. Oh. Teach artists how to start a business. Get on my email list because that's where I'm going to share it out first as soon as it's ready. There's so many things I want to share with other artists about yeah. how to do it. But the number one piece of advice that I have to impart and you need to internalize it so hard is that you need to be your own biggest 
before you do anything else. Because if you don't love your work, if you're not proud of your work, if you don't know that your work is going to change the world and make a difference, the hell does anybody else care? Right? Yeah. Don't necessarily make work because other people want you to make that work. If you don't love it, don't make it. If you don't enjoy in doing what you're doing, if it doesn't make you feel something, don't do it. My other business owner friend is always imparting on me. She goes, if it's not a hell yes. So that's definitely a good one to kind of keep in the back of your mind when you are trying to figure out how to sell your art. Because there's going to be people who want you to do stuff that's wide in your lane, but you might be able to make some money doing it and you got to trust your gut. Sometimes those are worth doing to make some money, pay your bills, whatever. But if you get that gut feeling that it's not a hell yes, say no to it because that client is going to be pain in your ass. You're not going to feel good about it. You're not going to bring your whole heart. It's going to be really hard to get inspired to do that. Other type of advice. Don't do things for exposure unless there is really valid return on investment of your time and your effort. If you make a piece of art that is at an event and you get to keep it later and you get to take it back and sell it, that's not do that for exposure. Do not do graphic design for other people for free. As my band teacher in high school told us, he's the reason I know not to do things for exposure. He said, people die of exposure. They sure do. Putting yourself out there without any protection, without anything covering your time. You didn't make money doing that. The person you made it for is benefiting, not you. But if you're doing something for that type of thing, like you want to get your work out there, you want more people to see it. If you're going to do something that is unpaid, make sure that it's going to bring you more payments. Before you even agree to do it, talk to the person who's asking you to do it. Ask what's in it for me. Aside from exposure, are you going to stop the program for five minutes and let me stand on the stage and tell the people in the audience all about you and your art and your business? Cool. That's worth it, depending on who's in the room. If they're just like, oh, we'll just put your logo on the flyer. Not worth it. Because nobody knows what that logo is. Nobody knows who you are. They're not getting your story. If you don't get that five minutes or two minutes or whatever, you don't get some kind of captive audience. You don't get a list of leads of all the people who are in that room. Don't do it. What else? Oh, my God. So <laughs> many tips for all the artists. But really, I mean, ask for help and take it. There are so many things that... Most people who start a business know nothing about starting a business. In general, this is just entrepreneurship advice. People come up with a cool idea of a product or a service that they can offer that they think they'd be good at doing. And then they figure out, okay, I'm, people want this. I'm going to sell it. But they don't know anything about building a business. So do your research. Go to the small business development center in your area. They offer them. They're in like every single area. They're usually on a college campus. And that shit is free. Go there. Learn everything you can. If there is a free workshop about doing something in your business, learning about bookkeeping, learning about AI, learning about this, learning about that, go to that as often as possible. If it's virtual, even better. But go to those things. Take advantage of all those resources, especially as an artist, because creative artist brains are so valuable in the business world. But if we think of solutions to problems that other people would be like, yo, that's crazy. That work. And the artist will be like, but it'll totally work. And here's how it'll work. And they make it happen because you think different. Putting yourself in the room of all those business people makes you very valuable to them too. And they don't realize it until you show up and you say, what about this? What if we think about it this way? And without, join networking groups. They're not all created equal. Why? Some networking groups if you walk in the room and you get the feeling like all these people want something from me, walk away. If you walk in the room and people come up to you and say, how can I help you? Who do you need to, me to introduce you to? What, do you? what are you looking to learn? What do you need help with? How can I lend my resources to help you do that? That's the room you want to stay in. And of all my years in business, the National Association of Women Business Owners, hands down, is the best working group I have ever been in, I've ever been part of. It is so valuable and I can't say enough. 
I just, I love it. The national events have the same feel that our local event did. And it's just like a sisterhood. You walk in and they're like, hey, girl, you're going to kick ass today. And I know it. I don't even know your name. And you know that you're like on my side. You got my back or whatever I need. Find your people like that. Oh, Jonna, that's excellent. Yeah, excellent, excellent advice. So many good nuggets in there for sure. Networking groups, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I had a guest on talking about networking and kind of going to these with being genuine and kind. How can I help somebody else? And when you're in that kind of space mindset and other people are in that space and mindset, great things happen. And remember YouTube and Google, whatever you need to learn, it's out there. To, you'll find it, right? The Biz, Small Business Administration, you know, all of these kind of things are great places to learn because we do often just stumble into this launching a business and we maybe don't have all the pieces to the puzzle, but you can figure it out, right? You can learn these things. And you can make it all come together. It just takes some time. It does. Yeah. It can never go bad, but it can always get better. But it can go bad if you don't know that you're supposed to file sales tax. No. <laughs> you know, you don't know what you don't know. And starting at the bottom and doing your research before you jump in, don't go start spending your personal money on your business. You know, if you want to start a business, do it right day one. Open a business bank. Put however much you want to invest of your own money in your business in that bank and keep records from day one because it's so much easier to say my business money I'm only using that for the business and if you're mingling your funds and you're like oh I'll just put this on here and I'll just put this on here it's going to be impossible not impossible a really big pain in the ass just straight out of your record later take your time do your research do it right yeah excellent point for sure Keeping that um, personal money and business money separate is absolutely, you're going to want to do that for tax purposes anyway. And, you know, the government's for sure going to want to see that all of that stuff is separate and not commingling, like you said, because otherwise then they'll say, it's not really a business then and forget all these write-offs not happening. Excellent stuff that you shared there. And we could keep going. I know you've got so many more great pieces of advice, but there's a couple of things that I want to touch on. And the first is you have your own podcast also. I'd love for you to share what that is, what you talk about on your show and share that with a listener so they can maybe take a look and um, listen and see what good stuff you've got there. So my show is called Reach the Stars Podcast, not Reach for the Stars, but Reach the Stars because you're already there. And it is a collection of conversations with cool people who do cool things. And we bring inspiring stories of persistence and passion and purpose. And there's artists, there's entrepreneurs, there's activists, there's writers, there's musicians. It's just this amazing collective of all these really deep, intentional conversations where I'm like, I know this person or don't know this person because <laughs> I've gotten to the point where I'm in interviewing people I don't know. But I started it because I knew all these amazing people. And it was during COVID. And I was like, what do I have to offer the world right now? I'm losing my mind. I think it's pretty obvious that I'm extrovert. Uh, I think it's tattooed on my forehead. But during COVID, I was really having a hard time because my husband is a total introvert. And mm -hmm. it was the first time in my life that I had to be with the same people all the time. Even since I was a kid, I was like, I don't even know how to be around only the same people all the time. I'm going with my mind. Like, I need other people to talk to. And my husband was like, please stop talking to me. So I started the show to be able to have conversations with all my amazing friends who lived all over the place who I couldn't go see because it was COVID. After the first episode, I was like, I'm on to this. I asked all the guests the same questions at the end of every episode. And it's so amazing to me to see even like 60 episodes deep Every single person answers those same questions in a different, completely different way, or at least a slightly different way. And just getting all of those perspectives and hearing all these stories permanently in a place. Because mm. the more digital the world is, thank God for Zoom. Like, before there was Zoom, everything was so disconnected. It was text, it was email, 
Sometimes it was Skype or FaceTime. But, you know, before those things happened, we got real digital real quick. And people were not having those deep, meaningful conversations like you have when you start on. Right? Like that oral history. I remember learning about oral history in school and being like, that's amazing. Like the only reason we know of any of that stuff is because someone told somebody else about it. That's so deep. Like how far back does that story go? How many people told that story over so they would remember it and tell it to somebody else and tell it to someone else? And we don't do that. We sit in our houses by ourselves and doom scroll on our phones, right? Like, but the more that you have these types of conversations, which like doing video conversations with people, like looking somebody in the face and having these conversations, really connecting about things that matter in the world and sharing ideas and sharing that we've learned from each other, how you change the world. That's what my show's about. Check out listen. But it's all audio that so you can go on any of the major podcast platforms and search Reeks the Stars podcast. We also have a YouTube. You can find all of the links to all of that stuff on my website, which is papercraftmiracles.com. If you go in the media tab, there's a podcast. There's a link to it on the homepage, too, if you scroll down. Yeah, I'll for sure include all that information also in the show notes. And, Jonna, you're speaking my language. I love everything that you are sharing on your podcast. It's the same thing. I just want to get as many stories and ideas and inspire and educate and you know, perhaps change the way you think about something or, you know, something new to discover. I think it's amazing. And the only way we do that is by talking to other people and sharing that with as many people as we possibly can. So I love it. And, you know, when you were saying that you have on your show, you're always asking the same five questions. And I always love to ask my guests what books or podcasts they're listening to or reading that have been beneficial or influential. And so I'm going to ask that question of you now. Is there books that you'd love to share with us or other podcasts that have been helpful for you that you think the listeners should check out? For sure. Um, so book-wise, I, my number one book, my favorite book my whole entire life is The Way and the Peaceful Warrior by Dan mm -hmm. I read it the first time when I was 19, when I was in college. And if I hadn't read that book before all that shit happened to me, I would be a for person. Being three days after that fire, being able to laugh and roll around in the ground and be like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All that stuff is going to go become something else. So the things that I've learned from that book, you know, when they say the book that changes lives on the cover, they're fucking around. I love Dan Milman, all of his books in general. But that book, I've probably read it like 15 or 20 times. I just finished reading it again, this mastermind group I'm in with a couple other business owners and going through it really intensely and like underlying every single line that really and then talking about each like chapter by chapter with the other people in the group it, it's really it changes like every time so can't recommend that book enough also this book the wisdom of the enneagram for those who are only listening to the audio version maybe not this particular version of it if you're not into some real deep heady background of stuff but um, learning about the enneagram and the different personality types that are in. There's a lot of different personality type quizzes, whatever. But this one in particular, like learning about the type that I am. I'm an enthusiast for anyone who does Enneagram. And that's pretty obvious, I think. As <laughs> well, once I learned about it, I was like, oh yeah, that, that one's me. Lots of ideas, lots of things that are new and fun and exciting. This is great. This is who I am. I'm doing this all the time. Let's add things to my plate when things are stressful. I'm just going to try a new thing and start a new thing and be fearless about this or that. Not just learning about how my type acts when I'm in a good place, but the mm -hmm. most beneficial thing about learning about the Enneagram was learning how my type behaves when I'm stressed or if I'm afraid of dealing with something that I need to be addressing. I will add more stuff to my plate to avoid mm -hmm. pain, fear, and loss. I know that and from reading the book. And I've gotten to the point where I notice, I can notice doing it. I worked with a coach to work on the Enneagram. And he was like, if you have more than five things on your to-do list, you're doing it again. If you're doing it again, you're never going to get those done. Don't add the new things till you finish the old things. You know, like you're speeding ahead because you don't, you want to avoid those things you really feel like doing. 
those are definitely my two top two books if you're going to read me podcasts lately lead like a woman by andrea houston oh oh my god she's interviewing all these amazing women leaders who are just changing the face of not they're not all entrepreneurs but they're all like there's founders from startups and then there's like ceos of big organizations and man the stuff that they have been talking about in that show it's great like <laughs> it has inspired me to add in new habits and you know, seize the day in, in a way I haven't in a while. So I'll say that one. That's the top of the mountain of this list, right? Excellent recommendations for sure. Two really good books. Thank you. And the podcast as well is absolutely new to me and has never been suggested before. So I'll include all of that in the show notes. I've just discovered Enneagram. And so I've been learning about that as well. It's so fascinating to me. Anytime you can learn more about yourself is a good thing. And, you know, how you're dealing with stressful times, happy times, you know, whatever the case may be, it's good to know about yourself. I love it. So before we complete the show, I want you to share now, you had mentioned your website before, but if people have questions for you, they want to dig into this a little bit more, maybe, you know, learn about the course that you're going to be putting out. How can people find you? Do you want to share social links? Um, anything else that would be a good way for people to connect with you? Sure thing. The easiest thing to do to stay up to date on all the news and know when on the course and all that kind of stuff comes out is to go on the website, sign up for the email list for sure. Because I have been, I've been fixing my email list and like getting on point with it and doing it properly. And I have a bunch of different types of emails that I send out and you can pick and choose the kind of stuff that you want because I hate that spammy crap. I don't send it crap that you don't want. So that's the easiest thing to do. And on Instagram, Facebook, I'm at Papercraft Miracles. I should have my personal Instagram, but I never ever use it. Always on the business page. And I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn too. I probably won't write back right away. If you find me on Instagram, follow me on Instagram. I'll probably write back. Okay, that's perfect. And I'll include that information in the show notes so listeners can easily find it and connect with you. Jonna, thank you again so much for coming on the show. I have really, truly enjoyed our conversation and what you're doing, the work that you're doing and how your art is helping others to learn to express themselves in ways or realize that they're not alone is amazing and tremendous. And so thank you for coming on and sharing all of this with us. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk more soon. Thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in to another insightful episode of the Pockets of Knowledge podcast. We appreciate your time and curiosity as we explore fascinating topics together. If you enjoyed today's discussion, be sure to join us next week for another amazing episode. Remember, your journey of learning and growth is a continuous adventure, and we're thrilled to be part of it. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next week, stay curious and keep exploring those pockets of knowledge.